Good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to be talking specifically around the issue of monocultures and technology, specifically around Tor and, and Tor Anonymity Network, and then work uh, into some of the work that we've been doing since last March um, with the Tor BSD Diversity Project and so on. Now, first, I mean, I assume everybody knows what Tor is. Does anybody not know what Tor is? And, unless your first name starts with Dan, you know. Um, um, and how many people actually use Tor, run a relay, run the browser, Tor browser? Um, OK. Um, so and just a quick note, like I'm, I'm kind of like Donald Trump. I like interaction better. I'm not the teleprompting type. Politically, I'm not, but I'm just saying. I, I don't mind questions during. Um, and so feel free to interrupt, raise your hand, or yell, or say expletives. Um, now, I, just so you know, I don't have any affiliations with the Tor Project. I know a lot of people there. I'm not one of the people. Uh, the Tor B TDP is really two of us. It's myself and a, a developer named Attila, who's an old school Carnegie Mellon Unix hacker uh, who has been around. And just real quick, for anybody who hasn't heard, there's been a bit of an upheaval in the Tor Project in the past week or so. Um, I'm not going to get into that. That's, that's really not on topic here. But you know, questions of sexual harassment, sexual assault, and so on and so forth that have gone on, that have kind of turned things upside down. Uh, what I will say is that I think what a lot of open source projects do, it's whether it's public or not, and whether people are talking about it. So if anybody you know go go reads uh, the tech news today, it's on Slashdot, it's it's on our, uh, Ars Technica, Wired, and so on and so forth. It is well worth actually getting and understanding uh, what's going on in that community for lessons for our own communities. Um, now, I want to start with the question of monocultures and so on. Now, probably, if you don't know about the monoculture argument, it really came out first in a technical context. Uh, Dan Greer, in debating Microsoft about Microsoft's monoculture on a desktop. Basically, you have one vulnerability that's in common throughout a whole system. In a whole ecosystem, you could actually demolish the ecosystem quite quickly. Um, Dan Greer, people know him. It was actually uh, Usenix ATC, I think, in 2004 where that debate happened, which is definitely well worth revisiting. Um, but actually, the, the bigger example that it's actually talked about in the popular press all the time is that of bananas, is the monoculture of bananas. And I'm not going to get too into it because it's not my field. Um, but basically, if you look at what's essentially a monoculture that's developed, in every you know, 10, 15, 20 years, there's a fear of an epi epidemic um, with, with bananas, and this particular species. Now, the vast majority of of bananas oops, um, are the Cavendish variety. So again, last year in Economist and a lot of the press, they were talking about a blight that affected this particular species of bananas, which means that literally you could have one uh, blight of one sort or another that would hit, every, hit bananas and spread to the rest of them because there was nothing distinguishing in the ecosystem. There, was, there were multiple common vulnerabilities that affected every one. And Again, it's all over the press. It's, it's a common thing that happens every few years. There's a fear of it. But all bananas have been wiped out at other points in the past. Then they come back and they develop a new one. Because it's so productive, because, because of all the, the positive aspects of actually having a monoculture, you know, being able to transplant methods of, of growing and, and fertilization and so on and so forth, it becomes cheap and easy to actually follow a monoculture. There's benefits with monocultures. It's much easier to manage a, a shop of all the same computers. It's much easier to grow one variety of bananas. And the same thing. Now, monoculture in particular is very, very relevant to lots of networks um, and types of networks and software uh, ecosystems. But specifically, um, with Tor, you're really looking at what is, from top to bottom, very much a Linux ecosystem, uh, monoculture. And so really, you know, Linux is Tor's Cavendish. You know, th there's little, a few other varieties along the edges and so on and so forth, but the core of the development the vast majority of the relays, uh, the most of the development and the attention actually is on the Linux aspect of things. And that includes you know, relays, Tor relays, the public relays that are actually routing Tor traffic, um, the tail system, which is a bootable system, um, and so on and so forth, RAM disk type stuff. Now, we, one of the little projects we do with Tor Diversity Project was to um, do come, some kind of like real quick ugly shell scripts to reveal some of the monoculture stuff. Now, this JSON da data that people are using today and they're doing these fancy things, these are just, this is really just scraped from some of the public uh, Tor, Tor uh, data that's available out there that 
uh, we threw together, and this is the Earl for it. Now, just, I'll, I'll go through a few of the different monocultures that you'll see, most specifically with software. Um, in absolute numbers, as of the other day or today, it was like uh, 7142 uh, Tor relays. Now, 89% of them are running Linux, okay? Um, Windows is a far second place than FreeBSD, Open, and so on and so forth. Um, bandwidth, the monoculture is even worse in many ways. So the absolute number of relays is bad, but actually you look at the bandwidth pushed by the operating systems, and it really is quite disturbing. Um, but you'll notice Windows is actually in a further lower position. So if Windows is five and a quarter percent of all the Tor relays out there, um, it's actually accounting for only 0.24% of the um, bandwidth push, probably because most of them are end users uh, using Tor browser and enabling it and so on and so forth. Uh, but you'll notice the gap between what FreeBSD is doing in terms of absolute number of relays and so on. And needless to say, I think of any technical community around, um, BSD people generally have more access to infrastructure, to data centers, and they actually know what data centers are still. I mean, we're facing now a generation of people who aren't don't realize that actually bare metal is ultimately behind you know, every cloud, every virtual system, and so on and so forth, um, which I'm, I fear the next generation isn't aware of. Um, but there's other monocultures to be worried about. Um, public relays uh, in, the, in the hard counts and the percentages, you know, Germany, the US, France, the Netherlands, Russia, and so on. I mean, that's not as ugly as, say, operating system diversity, but it is still quite ugly. Um, and bandwidth concentration. So France, for instance, um, yeah, <laughs> right? Okay. France is also the country that, after the attacks last uh, last year in Paris, that talked openly about banning Tor relays. <laughs> <laughs> it's not your fault, Bernard. Um, but but th that actually reveals why monocultures are particularly dangerous. I think just going back and looking at. The operating system, though, specifically, there's lots of things to worry about. We know that when you share one kernel, you're probably sharing, you know, random number generator. <laughs> you're sharing device drivers. You're sharing things like that. So that type of vulnerability, whether they're, you know, suspected or haven't been discovered yet and so on, certain, let's say, uh, three-letter government agencies probably are quite aware of any um, vulnerability. Oh, you see, I talk, I'm, I'm loud enough. I, I could talk to the whole building. Um, um, that, is, that is really a disturbing situation. And considering how important random number generators are on what is supposed to be a very, very randomized anonymity system, public network, and so on and so forth. Um, and there are actually discussions about that. Um, vulnerabilities in the uh, uh, random number generator and so on with Linux over the years. Now, again, exit relays is the last one. And, you know, ironically, the US of all places has you know, 15%. Actually, the distribution's much better when it comes to uh, exit relays, but still, it's, it's a very, very distorted picture because you take out 15, over 15% 15 of the exit relays for the Thor network, and you have a real problem. Can you, did I just go in and out? Can I, can you hear me? Okay. Um, you, have, you have a real problem when you're, you're deprecating a network to that extent. Now, I want to kind of visit the thing that, because, you know, I've been around BSD land for a very long time, I know a lot of the common arguments that people have about it and so on and so forth, why they won't use Tor, why they don't think Tor is a very good solution for, for lots of reasons. Now, number one, it's, it's the notion that Tor is owned, that it's a whole broken network. Um, regardless of the Linux question, regardless of the operating system, monoculture, and so on and so forth. And I think if you go back to the Snowden slides from a few years ago, the, sli the slides specifically by Booz Allen or whoever about Tor were pretty revealing. Number one, it was a central target for, for the NSA and other three-letter government agencies. Everybody wants to break Tor. There's bounties in Russia. It's all over the place. I mean, you don't get your creds in security land unless you, you have some supposed vulnerability in the Tor network that you present at DEF CON. I mean, it, it's one of those things. You, know, you just have to do it. Um, it's like blowing up mailboxes in the suburbs. Um, <laughs> sorry. Um, so, but obviously, you're also looking at adversaries who have way more border networks of of, uh, of, uh, of, the, of the Tor ecosystem and network ecosystems than anybody really imagined. They're not just watching packets and, and following IP addresses, they're actually looking at flows exiting, you know, through backbones and so on and so forth. Um, end of the day, though, uh, 
it, it should go without saying that Snowden used it and it worked. <laughs> and that's a case in point. There's really not cases of the Tor network itself being, being, um, being broken. It usually comes down to endpoint security, which everybody knows, right? I mean, you're not going to go sit there and try to break an IPsec tunnel you know, when the low-hanging fruit, the weak link in the chain, is actually the endpoint security. Because someone's running an unpatched desktop because of a laptop, because of the wireless network they're on, and so on and so forth. You actually go for the easiest point. Um, and finally, when it comes down to it, yes. You know, Tor isn't the ultimate solution. Nothing is the op ultimate solution. You know, you talk about pledge, Capscom, whatever. You know, no one's going, this is the be all, end all. Because it's an evolving model, evolving threat model, and so on and so forth. And there is actually discussion about what the next version of Tor would look like. Now, overall, though, the strengths is it's obviously open source. It's BSD licensed. There is a dynamic, engaging community. Um, interest in it actually shoots up when something happens, like the Snowden stuff, WikiLeaks, the Iranian elections in 20, uh, 2009, and so on and so forth. But it really is something of a low barrier to entry for new people to get involved in, which in many ways is quite specific. You know, for anybody to get like you know low barrier of entry with any of the BSDs is sometimes quite difficult, right? To actually start contributing. Someone could contribute almost like overnight without really knowing, unfortunately, too much, which is another fear, um, and actually start being productive and useful member. Now, um, specifically around TDP, a bunch of us have actually been doing related stuff going back years, and it means BOFs, um, meetings we'd have in New York, and so on and so forth. But we started really March last year, or GitHub started last year. And, uh, it, now, actually, time is marked by not Unix time anymore. It's like GitHub time, right? Um, March uh, 2015, and really, you know, again, the aim was diversification. And there was a bunch of aspects of our work. I think the main, you know, uh, uh, time-intensive thing that we've been working on, labor-intensive stuff, is around Tor Browser. Now, are people familiar with what we've done with Tor Browser, porting it to OpenBSD? Has anybody heard about that? I, we're not, our publicity department is quite weak. Anyway, okay. So, that's really been, uh, been our main thing. Right now, we're dealing with Tor Browser 6.0, which is the newest release, but there's huge jumps in the Firefox uh, extended service release versions uh, that were quite dramatic with OpenBSD that, that's kind of a, a little bit of a hitch in what we're doing right now. Um, there's a bunch of other things, you know, the resources that we put up and so on and so forth. Now, there is quite a long history with BSDs uh, and PETs, which is, you know, privacy enhancing technologies, which is a broad term for Tor, BGP, and a whole host of other things. And this is actually an exchange between Theo Durat and Julian Assange in 2001 about rubber hose crypt, uh, encrypted uh, file system. Anybody know about rubber hose? Basically, it was a way, instead of like storing um, passwords in your head or somewhere where someone could beat you with a rubber hose and make you reveal it, it was a way to subconscious, uh, subconsciously store passwords based on human cognitive uh, nature and so on and so forth. So this was Julian Assange reply to Theo about um, Julian Assange moving from the BSD license to GPL, which, you know, you personally are viewed as a disgrace in open BSD, little more than some kind of net BSD, milli vanilli. I'd have to explain that. Um, one should avoid at all costs. Anyway, pretty funny. There's also exchanges between Robert Watson and, uh, and Julian Assange in the same time period, which were quite interesting. And uh, what I want to kind of go back, because people are like, oh, why are you wasting your time with Tor Browser? No one cares. We have people outside the BSD community who are going, there aren't any BSD desktop users. Who cares what you, know, what you guys are doing? It's kind of a waste. And, and then obviously within the community, people are like, why are you looking at that? Why don't you look at the, the, you know, how they're using, uh, generating, um, sorry, using entropy in Tor? How, well, how come you're not looking at the network stuff more? And so on and so forth. But the reality is, and it's sometimes hard to, to remember when you're a developer, but people actually go into operating systems and use it in production when it actually does what they want to do. They go, OK. I'm, I'm just kidding. I knew you're, he's just doing this to bother me. Staten Island thing. Um, so, Tor Browser is basically a heavy, heavily modified version of Firefox extended service release with a lot of privacy enhancements. Um, everything's Soxified to the extreme extent where no, DNS and so on and so forth aren't being leaked over the public internet. They're actually, DNS lookups are happening over Tor network, so they're actually going over TCP. Um, and it's basically a self-contained browser that, that has lots of different attributes. There's some Firefox add-ons that are part of it, no script, HTTPS everywhere, which I'll talk about later. 
Um, but it's really meant to be an, uh, a tool for anonymity for online web browsing. Tor overall is a TCP network, so anything that goes over TCP can go over Tor. Um, but Tor browser is the kind of popular usage of, of the Tor network that most people kind of bump into. Does that help you, Thomas? If you have any other questions like that. Um, so, um, so again, people go to where the best supported OS. So there's been like a little bit of a stampede towards uh, FreeBSD with ZFS because if you want to run Postgres, you know, you like ZFS, that helps a lot, and you either pay, you know, Oracle a license fee or you just run it on FreeBSD because that's where you get a great implementation of ZFS. It's very much the case when it comes to software overalls. People, the first thing a lot of people do, whether in a production scenario uh, at work or for their own personal usage, to go, does my OS run this port? Does it run this package? Which, and when it comes down to it, people have some level of security consciousness, whether or not they're in the BSD community. They I mean, a lot of people do look at the BSDs as somehow, um, for obvious reasons, much more secure, much more stable, and with an idea detail. I mean, if anybody saw the Washington Post or Washington uh, uh, Wall Street Journal article with Linus Torvalds last year about security, where he called the open BSD people masturbating monkeys and they were over concerned with security, you know, when you have that happen, it's quite easy for us to kind of come off as the saner group of people in the room. Um, <laughs> Now, again, you might go, well, you know, so there's way more desktop users with FreeBSD, PCBSD, and so on and so forth. Um, why OpenBSD? And I, I don't know the exact numbers. Everybody, like, NiceBug, people know DMessageD, the NiceBug thing. Um, you know, we can't judge it by the number of submissions of DMessages that people upload. Um, it's actually, OpenBSD is like a close second. We have no idea who's using what on what desktops. Um, However, if we integrated some of the Ubuntu data mining aspects, maybe we could figure out, um, we could know that for sure. Um, so the thing about OpenBSD is that I mean, people don't know already, there's a real strictness about standards, you know. Um, I'm quite excited because recently, tail added dash F for multiple files. So if you want to tail multiple files, you don't have to install a, a package report for that now. You can tail multiple files with dash F now, which Brian's going to laugh because for years, I've been like, how come you can't tail multiple log files with dash F and OpenBSD? Because it wasn't POSIX. <laughs> and there's continually a strictness when it goes back to it, which means it's more portable, which means you're not going to have you know, different options and so on and so forth that aren't portable to other, other operating systems. As long as something vaguely respects POSIX and so on, it's much easier to bring something from OpenBSD to other operating systems. Thus, you have, there's an application, I don't know if anybody's familiar, OpenSSH. Open NTBD, so on and so forth. Arc for random, and so on. They, they, they're extremely portable, easy for anybody in a POSIX -E, uh, type operating system to port. Um, and also, a lot of the bloat that goes on in software, especially the stuff that's the upstream is Linux world, um, you know, a lot of those assumptions is like, you know, don't just not, don't just change it on the OpenBSD port, push it upstream. And there's things like this. I mean, this is totally an end user thing, but. If you want to actually check the digital signature on Tor browser, you're an end user, there's, okay, here's the checksum, here's the SHA-256 checksum or whatever, but if you actually want to check the digital, digital signature, okay, step one, download, you know, PG, uh, GPG. Step two, this, step two, and, and like an end user, actually, not an end user, I mean, anybody who uses GPG is going, what did I just do? You know, did I just like distribute my private keys around the world? And uh, if you use the wrong yes. version of GPG, it won't even download your keys at all. Boom. Yep, Bernard. You like GPG? What? I, the more technical people are, I think the more likely they've screwed up with PGP, but and especially GPG. I mean, GPG is like the uh, the open SSL of uh, of email in many ways. I mean, it, I mean, I know NetBSD people work in NPG. I don't know where it is. I know it's in use in production. I mean, Diner trying to get someone, all the NetBSD developers in New York trying to get someone to talk about it. Uh, for a meeting and actually have some back and forths on it, but uh, to no avail, unfortunately. But something like Signify, um, it's small, it's portable, and so on and so forth, is a great drop-in replacement. You know, like, instead of giving someone, like, instructions on downloading this bloated, you know, uh, tarball for GPG, you know, having Signify integrated is quite easy, it's small, and so on and so forth, actually play the same role. And <clears throat> 
and, and I'll say this, and, and again, I'm not mocking anybody, but I know a lot of the, the developers, young and old and so on, who are in the, the pet scene, and, the, and, and, the, and, the, and you find a lot of young developers are going, well, yeah, I wrote an RNG you know, in JavaScript or in Java to do this and this and this. And I like to think that in, in BSD land, it's, it's not that everybody could write an RNG. It's that most of us know we can't write an RNG. <laughs> and so when you have things like Arc for Random from OpenBSD, it really you know, cheapens the overhead and takes away uh, an obvious point of weakness in what people are doing with implementations. I'd rather trust you know, a piece of portable software from OpenBSD or from any of the BSDs over what some 22-year-old who's on a project for six months who's going to drop the project anyway after a couple of months, who's going to spend more time and effort on publicity than actually implementation and code review. Um, and so Arc for Random, for instance, makes things quite easy. And obviously, if you get, if you get an OpenBSD port, you could probably get in anywhere. <laughs> um, so there's lots of problems with porting. How much time? How do I look with time? What's, when's this session over? Anybody know? Beautiful, beautiful, good. Um, so there's lots of problems with porting Tor Browser to OpenBSD, which are, uh, I mean, because anonymity is moving target, because the adversaries are going, oh, let's break this, let's do that. Um, and it's going back and forth. And when it comes to censorship, lots of countries around the world, I mean, you're dealing with a couple hundred adversaries, the national adversaries, who are either doing surveillance or censorship and blocking um, Tor and so forth. Um, but obviously, Mozilla code itself is a moving target. It's a large moving target. It, unfortunately, it's not a slow moving target, though. <laughs> it's, uh, it's a big clunky mess of, of, of uh, nightmares. You can actually, if anybody talks to Landry at OpenBSD, I mean, I'm sure he could you look at his, his posts on Portsat and you'll, you'll get a sense. And obviously, if you're de doing development on OpenBSD, you've got to be working on snapshots. And you know the, uh, the regular snapshots uh, current that comes out. And it, that gets quite difficult, because obviously, it's current, it's snapshots. There's going to be some breakage. There's going to be some quick changes, and so on and so forth. And all the work you do has to really stick there before you get into the ports. Um, and lots of times, obviously, with, with uh, the changes that OpenBSD developers want in software to be ported, it's always like, well, that's got to go to the upstream. That, that should go to the upstream. Stop doing, you know, worrying about your own patches. Get it upstream, because that, that actually should be a portable uh, thing. And I'll get into it a bit more, but Bash, I mean, the, uh, Bash is all over. Um, so. So you'd be surprised where you find Bash. I mean, you talk about standards and POSIX. Um, a lot of people actually think POSIX means use Bash today. Um, and it, it's true with a lot of young developers. They're like, de facto is Bash. And we've actually had you know, a lot of headaches. And I'll get into some specifics if you want. HTTPS Everywhere, the Firefox add-on, yes, the Firefox add-on, add has a build depend of Bash, which, I mean, that makes no sense whatsoever. And so what we've done on the Tor BSD website is every time we mention the word bash, we actually link it to the MITRE vulnerabilities, just, just in case someone happens to click it. I mean, if you look at, you can't find a vulnerability in KSH unless you go back to the old, old, old KSH uh, 93. I think there's one vulnerability. And I don't think there's any vulnerabilities with TC shell. But the fact that you have a, a shell with so many vulnerabilities, and most of the actual capabilities aren't even used by 99% of the uh, the, uh, the functions of Bash aren't even used by anybody, um, you know, kind of makes the point of why it's ugly. And, and this is, again, true for a lot of the, the, the scripts you'll find online from, any, from anybody else from any of the projects, you know, hard-coded variables, um, and, and so on. So actually misdefined variables also. Um, defining variables, you know, three-quarters of a way through a 7,000-line uh, 7, shell script, yes. Um, things like that going on, and it really makes it quite difficult. And that's why, and, and this is, Michael Lucas probably didn't come to mind. He hears me talk enough. Um, but Michael Lucas wrote this about writing technical books, and I actually think it applies as much to uh, scripts and, and coding and so on as to anything else. And it's really, you know, don't write to be understood, write so you can't be misunderstood. Oh, Jesus Christ. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> that, was, that was Brian Callahan, actually. I, you know. I'm sorry? Yeah. Um, so again, just to follow up the whole thing about a lot of the suspicions I know specifically in the BSD community about Tor, you know, it's not perfect. Yes, 
If you could watch an entire network because you have enough relays out there and so on and so forth, it's not good. Yes, there's common denominators which are potentially very dangerous about the Tor network. Um, and also there's, you know, no one's hedging when they talk about anonymity and privacy solutions a lot of times. They're, not, they're going, this is the solution you should use. And you can't do that in security and privacy and so on and so forth. You're always really talking about mitigation, end of the day. You know, you're talking about the best solution in a particular context. There's no like bulletproof, you know, wonder uh, solution. There's no best operating system for everything and so on and so forth. And it's definitely true when it comes to Tor and privacy also. Now, the argument around what we've been trying to do in terms of disruption of the monoculture is things like, you know, looking at the number of BSD relays. Again, you're looking at you know, five and a quarter, five and a half percent of BSD relays, uh, of Tor relays, public relays rather, are running a BSD. Um, I know when I spoke in Brazil, I'll say hello to my Brazilian friends, um, there was like one Windows uh, relay and all Linux relays. Now it's kind of fluctuated up to a third or a quarter of, uh, excuse me, Tor traffic in Brazil is actually running over a BSD relay. You know, so it's, it's quite easy and there's a lot of low-hanging fruit. A place like India, you know, has, I mean, used to a lot of technical infrastructure, a lot of technical people, and it's got like a dozen Tor relays in it. I mean, it, it's shocking, but it's really an next opportunity for, especially countries which are BSD heavy. You know, you think of Turkey, which maybe not Turkey today, but lots of Japan, another great example, is a handful of BSD relays out of, you know, hundreds of relays in the country, you know. But the BSD community is quite large, you know, engaged and so on and so forth. Um, and, and it's a great opportunity. Uh, now we have a, uh, another effort going on right now, which we haven't put a lot of time and energy into, but we have a lot of large BSD using firms out there, which most people don't realize they do unless you're in the BSD community, but you know, companies like Netflix and so on and so forth. So New York Internet, who kind of like says default yes to everything, nice bug ass anyway. <laughs> um, oh, he was there. <laughs> um, they have agreed to, to host two high bandwidth uh, Tor relays for us at some point. Um, but lots of, lots of large BSD firms are internet facing. They have the bandwidth, they have the infrastructure, they hopefully have the technical staff. You know, they have staff that actually knows that RAM is a physical thing that goes into a slot and there's clips and everything else. They don't just think everything's virtualized and bare metal no longer exists. Um, so there's a huge advantage to that. Um, but again, and, and we've had some conversations uh, recently about it, we're focused on, on uh, Tor browsers and OpenBSD ports, um, but we've made it, and it's easy enough, if you're going to look at porting Tor browser to any other BSD, please clone our repo. If you have questions of what we're doing or why we're doing, we'll tell you why. There's lots of bad paths and ugly, rocky paths and unmaintainable paths to go down when it comes to Tor browser. Um, and our whole method, methodology isn't perfect yet either. But you really could kind of go into a bind when you sit there and you have like 75 patches to maintain, which I know the package source work that someone's doing right now is going down that kind of ugly, rocky path. Um, that's great for one release, but it doesn't work for the second, third, and so on and so forth. Um, and I've talked to Sean Webb from Harden BSD, who's actually interested in, in starting to look at it. And I think it's, it's a great opportunity to uh, start replicating the effort. Um, and then obviously, you know, contributions to documentation. And I, I had another slide here that I ripped out because of, of timing I was concerned with. Um, but also in terms, it's not just about like, you know, running relays and running a browser and so on and so forth and, you know, helping out. It's also a great platform for looking at optimizing networking. Um, now one of the things that tends to happen is we kind of like in BSD land, we tend to look for like sane defaults on stuff. So you don't have to sit there, rebuild your kernel, make changes and so on and so, you know, turn lots of knobs in the process with sys controls and so on. Um, but what you actually see in, in the Linux community is lots of TCP enhancements or changes that happen along the way. So you actually see lists literally this long of change, sys control knobs to turn uh, in the process. Now I'm not saying th there's nothing to turn because there, there may, might be optimizations to turn with TCP traffic and smart things to do along the way. Randomizing IP IDs on, um, on FreeBSD, which is in default, um, is actually something you should do. Um, but but, um, but it, it is actually a good platform to start playing with, you know, what, how can we optimize, how can we make changes, and so on and so forth. Um, but again, you know, you think of what Scott Long did at Netflix, where he threw down, you know, default builds of, 
you know, FreeBSD 10 and said, hey, let's see how it goes. And without any optimization, without any changing, it was actually pushing way more traffic than any other operating system without any tweaks, without any work being done on it. Um, it's difficult, and I'll, and I'll actually, uh, I'll cite GNN on this, uh, George Neville Neal from FreeBSD, but when I asked him early on about setting up test environments for Tor and so on, he said, well, how could you actually set up a test environment for Tor? It's a randomized network. How do you actually, you know, judge the results from yesterday or with these sys control changes versus those sys control changes? You can't. It's extremely difficult. If you actually can't control your sample, <laughs> then you're in a bad spot to actually judge um, lots of factors. Because you'll have Tor relay traffic that just goes like this. And, and it, there'll be no rhyme or reason to it. It'll jump around, and it's actually part of the nature of, a, of an anonymity network. Um, let me just stop for a second, because there, is there questions, comments, anything? I'm sure people have. Hmm? Yeah. So uh, there's a Tor status dot blutmcgee dot de, blutmcgee, I don't speak German, um, which shows a breakdown of the public Tor relays. Just a few months ago, they started actually uh, listing the AS numbers along with it. I actually haven't played with the stats on it, but I've been thinking about it, especially in the past week. It's a huge relevant thing to do, because obviously the more AS numbers you're using, the better. There's another problem, obviously, and I was talking to Fessler from OpenBSD about this the other day, but I didn't realize, like, Facebook only has one AS number, apparently. You know, look how many AS numbers uh, some of the big, you know, internet, you know, what's the term for it? The big internet companies are using today. Um, and some of them have up to seven. I think Amazon like might have seven, but a lot of them actually have, you know. See, so, so th there's that weighing that how many you know large entities have you know only a handful of AS numbers, and then also comparing it to there's like how many are AWS AS, AS I don't know if, how many AS numbers AWS uses. Anybody know? Oh, um, but that in particular is is hugely important, and so on and so forth because. Even if you have an adversary that can look over an entire network, and a, a passive global adversary it's called, that can see the whole network, obviously breaking up the AS numbers, uh, their access to certain data centers and physical locations and so on, does matter. You know, it, it's a better idea to run, you, you know, it's a bad idea to run two tour relays or three tour relays in South Korea. It's better to run at least one of them in North Korea. Because <laughs> the likelihood of collaboration um, with watching traffic and so on and so forth is a lot less likely, which is really part of the strength of the Tor network. Because it's a volunteer network, you have both sides. You know, you have pigs and perps. <laughs> you have, you have uh, you know, all types of characters in the equation who are trying to use Tor for their own purposes, whether you like them or not. You know, you, you could hate, you know, the U.S., for instance, and want to block all traffic from the U.S. because you don't want people in the U.S. to have, you know, anonymous traffic. On the other hand, you're probably blocking people you get along with a lot, too. I mean, that's the thing about anonymity. Anonymity needs crowds. And so the more people from three-letter government agencies running Tor Relays, actually the better. You want everybody running Tor Relays, you know, and so on. So other questions related are on there? Um, that's kind of like following up. I didn't realize I could do it that quickly. Um, that's really uh, kind of closing it up there. Now, is there other, I mean, I want to go back to the Tor browser stuff. now. Has anybody used and run the packages of Tor Browser on OpenBSD? Fine. Anybody else in the room? OpenBSD. Basically, you have to run them off the snapshot. Hmm? And, uh, and right now, we're still stuck on 554. We didn't do 555, and then 6.0 just came out. And it tends to be every time we do a release, there's an additional Tor release. <laughs> So we kind of look like we're always behind the, the, uh, the, um, the, the routine with it. So now, Sean, have you looked at actually porting to our browser on hardened BSD? Or have you cloned the GitHub at least?
so we've been really, really fortunate because Landry at of OpenBSD has made a number of changes to the, to the uh, Mozilla Make File uh, framework for us that have, have really taken away a lot of headaches. Um, so that's been part of it. I, I need to look at the previous deport stuff and how it's done because I'm not as familiar. Um, but that's a massive part of uh, you know, the advantage we've had because we've had to do less patching uh, during the install with, with the, the, the port in the, in the source than we had to, um, than we would have had to because of the changes he's made to the BSD make file, which, for a Mozilla make file, which we can get into. So, so other questions, comments? Now, is there anybody who does NetBSD ports in the room? Actually, a lot of them are in New York, ironically. <laughs> um, I had to come to Ottawa to not find any. Um, uh, what about Dragonfly D ports, which I know is a lot in common with package, in, package uh, from FreeBSD? Sorry? Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's based on FreeBSD ports, I was just saying, yeah. So, um, that, I mean, frankly, if it's ported to Harden BSD, I don't think going to package NG and FreeBSD ports is that big a deal. Right? It should be rel obviously relatively easy. Does anybody know? For dependencies? One big happy family, right. Um, <laughs> it was easier when everybody used the same port system, like similar. Remember many years ago when it was really similar? <laughs> kind of similar, more or less. Um, so, okay, now let's, uh, I want to shift gears a little bit and go back to the relays thing. I want to ask again, like how many people are running relays in the room to our relays, public relays? Okay, that's a decent number, handful. Um, and what kind of bandwidth are you looking at for your relays right now? Like how many is the uh, allocated for your relays? One meg. One meg? One megabit. Mm -hmm. Rick's not, I know that. <laughs> um, anybody else? Okay, the, the, so there's, there's multiple Tor statuses. There's Blute McGee and there's RUECKGR.AT. And then there's also atlas.torproject.org. There's diff, the whole uh, method of actually collecting stats on the Tor network right now is changing, has changed quite drastically. So Blute McGee is an average number, while uh, this, uh, RUECKGR is actually like a maximum or snapshot picture.
So there's, there's a bunch of things you should be doing if you want to run it. <laughs> like online banking? So, so the thing is, is there's a few things you should be doing if you want to run an exit node. First, you don't have to run an exit node, and you could contribute greatly. Um, that has, it's a big deal if you do it uh, without running an exit node. If you do want to run an exit node, um, it's generally not illegal anywhere to do it. And the FBI and anybody else who would be doing investigations are at the point now where they go, oh, it's a Tor exit relay. Obviously, you don't have access to logs. You don't know who it is. Uh, you know, and a lot of the argument from... Really, operators is just like, you know, I'm running a router. You know, like, am I responsible? Are people who, uh, who uh, maintain, run routers on the public internet, are they responsible for every, you know, packet that goes through that router? You know, and it's like, no. But it's a harder argument, obviously, when it comes to Tor, because it's a relay. It's on an anonymity network and so on and so forth. And there's a number of steps that's actually uh, elaborated on the Tor website. One, you want to set the PTR to you and not the provider. Right? You want the reverse to come to you, um, and so on. And actually saying Tor exit relay dot whatever helps. Um, there's also putting up a website that, you know, resol that with the A record resolves, um, which is telling people this is a Tor exit relay, blah, 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 blah. Um, the other thing is to actually run it as a corporation. So own it as a corporation. Um, so that, you know, or a nonprofit ideally. So, you know, it's an organization. They're not going to go. Oh, this is a nonprofit. They're clearly involved in, you know, whether whatever nefarious things that Tor people might be involved in. Um, but what I do know is that yes, I mean, the Tor public really list is public. So for a provider, for anybody like Cloudflare, for instance, which is a huge deal most most recently, to block all the Tor IPs is quite simple. I mean, it's not that big a deal. Or to do additional capture, or to ban posting and you know, on forums and so forth, it isn't uncommon. It's more and more common today. It's really kind of picked up speed in the past few years because it wasn't true before. If you're do running a tour, uh, relay, a public relay out of your home on your residential connection, um, it's very good chance that that will be a publicly listed Tor IP and you try to go to your banking website like someone I know happened in, in the Southern Hemisphere and you can't get to your bank because you're blocked. Yeah, again, because it's a public, it's not necessarily that you're pushing exit traffic, but it's a public tour IP. And that's the thing. So what I would actually recommend at home is that if you're doing it at home and you just have a simple, you know, broadband connection at home, is be a bridge, be a public bridge, which those IPs are distributed much more carefully. They're, they're done two at a time or whatever. And it helps people who are actually block from the public tour IPs to access it. And it's much harder for an adversary to go, oh, this is a bridge IP. You actually can't just look up all the bridge IPs at once. Um, so that's actually a smart thing. Right, which is good in some ways of like diversifying you know, geography and so on and so forth, like DigitalOcean, I mean, there's a bit of a question about that, but yeah, it's good because it's out of the residence and so on and so forth. Uh, on the other hand, um, you know, I think it's not a hard argument here, but to say that bare metal, you know, is better than <laughs> over VPSs any day of the week for a whole variety of reasons, um, which I think should be quite clear in the audience. Uh, but um, again, the other thing is really, I mean, I would run, if at home, run a bridge. Um, Oh, 
Massimo? I'm sorry, you need to what IPv6? You need to. There is IPv6 support for. I'm not using it. I'm, I'm in America. I have plenty of IPs. <laughs> 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 you peasants can deal with IPv6. <laughs> Thanks, Phil. <laughs> I'm sorry? One of yours is. Yeah, and actually, oh, fuck, sorry. Vinicius from, uh, from uh, Brazil has actually provided a Tor C file, which is a Tor you know, config file, Etsy file, user local Etsy file, for Tor that with IPv6 information, which is on our website somewhere. Uh, we didn't link it, but he, he actually provided IPv6 um, Tor RC file, config file, um, which, is, which is awesome. Oh, I hit X. Um, uh, but let me think. I mean, I, I, I do think that, you know, it's a kind of less technical issue, but you actually do have conversations with providers. Uh, a lot of people are at providers or big entities and so on and so forth. And opening up that discussion about why they should run Tor Relays and so on and so forth is a major one. And we, we started again doing a sub-project around that, um, you know, trying to address people, uh, entities, large firms running, uh, running BSDs because they have the staff, because they have the expertise in the hardware and so on to actually run Tor Relays and why. Um, I mean, you can talk about, obviously, the freedom of speech thing. I mean, lots of journalists of any trade in the world, non-technical, journalists are probably the biggest users of Tor, uh, along with embassies. And increasingly, a layer of lawyers, especially in the involved civil rights work. That was one of the things that was revealed and scared a lot of lawyers for, out of the Snowden disclosures. Um, but we actually do need to get better at making the case. And the unique thing is unlike, again, what I said earlier, most technical communities, a lot of people in BSD community are in a much better position to actually lobby and have the full-on discussions with, with data centers and colo uh, firms and so on and so forth and have that discussion. And it, it's a winnable argument and discussion to have. Um, and especially, I mean, quite honestly, let me pick out one firm that, you know, claims to be the dot in, in the uh, in TLDs. Sorry. Um, you know, you're a big firm, and I'm not going to mention any names, but you know, you took over things from ICANN quite a number of years ago, temporarily at least. And you're in a position where you're running Tor Relays on your IPs, you know, and the FBI calls you, and you know, some first level help desk person goes, yeah, that's us. It's a Tor Relay. Uh, what do you want me to do? The FBI's going to raid Verisign? Sorry. <laughs> the FBI's going to raid you? No. I mean, anybody from the FBI who's going to be calling a large provider like, like the V word, um, will be in a position where they're like, oh, forget it, what am I doing? You know, of course. They're routing other people's packets. What am I going to do? And it says it's a Tor Relay. I mean, setting and, and legitimizing running Tor Relays, to me, is really up to a lot of the larger uh, BSD using entities. Mozilla, in December 2014, started running a bunch of, uh, a, a dozen decently high bandwidth Tor Relays, obviously running Linux. Um, but, but that actually legitimized things for a whole layer of people in the, in the corporate world, insofar as Mozilla's corporate, um, to actually you know, run Tor Relays. And I think that precedent can be you know, created in one out of the BSD community. Because again, the number of, of entities that are using BSDs out there. Other questions, comments? How many people have, are familiar enough with Raspberry Pis and the little ARM v6, v7 stuff to be running services on them? Like, right, right. You're not running. You're not running the default Linux or something, right? You know. Um, so yeah, I mean, so I actually we have a build we've been playing with on the side using FlashRD 
from Chris Capuccio from OBSD uh, for running and configuring his setup really hands off Tor bridges um, and not ARM, but actually using Alex boards, I3D6, uh, to run a bridge out of, of, of a residential network. Um, and it's quite easy, it's quite simple. Flash RD, you know, just to say, you know, similar with nano BSD or using the crochet scripts and so on and so forth, anything can actually build uh, systems that are RAM disk based, memory disk based on some level or another are really ideal. Because if you're running a bridge, you're not going to sit there and go, you know, I'm getting 50,000 connections in an hour. You know, these aren't like, you know, spamming mail servers. Th these are things that if you take a few connections a day or, you know, one an hour, you're actually contributing to diversifying the Tor network. Um, but it, it's very doable. I mean, anybody who's used Crochet, Flash RD, or any of these, or actually built any, any uh, base uh, BSD system on, on Flash, you know, using heavy Flash memory, uh, Based this uh, partitions and so on, it's it's not that hard, you know. And to do it, you know, it's an exercise and that's actually quite fun. I mean, sometimes it's hard with Alex Sports finding CF cards, you know. To to find a, a four gig CF card today is incredibly difficult. Um, it's either like you know you want a terabyte a CF card or nothing, um, and so on. How many people are actually at entities that could potentially run Tor Relays at, at their company? And what stops you from doing it? What would stop you? What do you imagine? My advice, don't, don't run an exit first and talk to the technical, I mean, are you a part of the infrastructure staff? Okay, talk to the appropriate people, say this is what I want to do, I'm going to limit the bandwidth to this, but I'd like to do it, and it won't be exit traffic. Actually, you don't even have to tell them, frankly. So yeah, the exit really thing, again, I mean, if it's a university, they're going to assume it's some screwy student who's screwing around, right? But you might actually want to figure out formally how to present it to the relevant people, and make the case for freedom of speech, and so on and so forth. Well, I wasn't even aware of that people did this stuff quite common, so it's kind of exciting. Wonderful, wonderful. That's my email address, actually an alias for me, and uh, not because of anonymity, just because it's easier, um, and my GPG fingerprint. Um, other people, and what would hold them back from doing it? Oh, Globe, Globe, for, for looking up stats and so on and so forth. Yeah, yeah. To be honest, the quick and dirty stats stuff was like, you know, in like a 12-line shell script, how could I, in a little bit of awk, how could I spit out like interesting stats that show, you know, on, the lack of diversity and variance in the Tor network. That was really the goal for it. But yeah, you could do individual lookups with Globe um, and so on and so forth. There's lots of these. Unfortunately, a lot of these projects start up and then like they die and they look like they're still up. I mean, it's kind of a sign of the open source world, we know. Um, other people who could be running Tor Relays uh, in, at their job, university, so on, questions on that? Well, I mean, you could, frankly, you could download the image, the Glenn Barber images, GJB images, you know, install Tor with package, right? Whereas... Because, I mean, I mean, our side is really, I mean, it's, it's been a difficult situation because, you know, I thought I could implement a lot of these services on them and, you know, they're actually pretty... I don't think anybody's, like, small 32-bit ARM stuff is stable. You know, like, there might be a lot of default Linuxes out there, as the operating system choice, I don't think they're any better. I mean, all the headaches we have in BSD land with 32-bit. You need Advil? What? <laughs> Good, Sean.
Again, just to finish my thought though, I mean, cool, yeah. I mean, I've had, I, I jumped into the freebies, the arm stuff right away in the beginning with the beans of crochet and so on and so forth. But, you know, quite honestly, when it comes to running small embedded devices that where you need the uptime and stability, I still would kind of, you know, go back to maybe not Socrus 4801s. <laughs> if anybody's old enough, I know there's, there's people here younger than Socrus 4801s at this point. Um, <laughs> Uh, but, you know, using, look at the Alex boards, you know, the 3D2s and so on and so forth. I mean, they have VGA out, whatever. I mean, they're, they're cheap. Or they're not getting as cheap as they should be, frankly, but they're out there. They're available. And, you know, to do an install, the target on, onto the CF card and do it that way, I mean, it's fine. You know, especially the Alex boards have a, the, the hardware crypto accelerator in there. There's a bunch of positives about running it on an Alex board. Cal So, I mean, this, this is where you kind of go into the more theoretical, because I haven't done it, but um, using, you know, any kind of virtualized systems and so on and so forth, uh, you're going to, there's potential threat models that you have to be concerned with, right? So the time drift, you know, might actually be, you know, readable along. So a, 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 an adversary that can actually correlate that time drift between multiple systems might realize it's the same one. And then the RNG, the entropy pool, is quite often the same, comes out of the same place. Now again, I'm not about to go crack someone's boxes because of similar time drift between them, but you've actually got to think about some of the more extreme paranoid threat models when it comes to Tor, you know, because of the way it's a target. Because you're not just looking, at, you're not looking at like the good the governments like Tor and the bad governments hate Tor. I mean, there's lots of people like getting money from the US government today to do Tor work, they, they kind of think like that. That's obviously not a reality. Like every government wants it for their own benefit, but every government actually wants to break it for their own benefit also. Sometimes the people are sitting next to each other. <laughs> Sometimes even the same person. Um, but yeah, I mean that's really the the case for it to me. I mean it is and obviously there's more code. Yeah, of course it is. Of course it is. And actually, it's better if you're one person in one data center in one AS number in one, you know, slash 24 or whatever. I think it's actually better to one run one relay. Yeah. You know, to sit there and just for the sake of it try to run like 15 relays, you know, on one small net block, you know, with one AS number or same data center. I mean, the larger the relay, the more likely it is to get more traffic. So small relays don't get the attention. This is actually one of the weaknesses in the. So, so the, I, I think you have to be going like you know providing 50k to be on the Tor network to be useful at all, but actually it's a meg, it's a megabit of data. Uh, to be honest, you actually want to be running. I mean, in my opinion, to have an impact, and quite honestly, it's unforgivable if you're in a data center environment and you have the resources to not be running a, a 10 megabit relay or 5 megabit relay. I mean, cable connections in the U.S. home. You know, you can easily run a five megabit uh, relay as long as you keep the kids off streaming games and so on and so forth for the higher cost. It's the highest CPU usage of any TV, right? Even with one megabit. So that's it, CPU. Yeah. But it runs fine. Wait, one megabit and, you, and it's the biggest. Okay, it shouldn't be that bad, but it's a lot of it's in weight. It's actually not. It's not. It's not actually doing anything. It's just sitting. Yeah, yeah. Idle. I would actually get the relay up and running first, and then worry about exit though. Just the last argument about VPSs and so on and so forth, and you know, I know it's not just the open BSD line on this stuff, but I think it's in general the BSDs. I mean, the less code, the better, right? I mean, 
the less code on a system, less likely there's their vulnerabilities. So when you're adding VPSs, there's a certain delusion about virtualization in a lot of the Linux community, I think, about the benefits security-wise of virtualization um, and the strengths of it, when actually just increasing the number of lines of code in a system is bad. I mean, it, I think that's our position. I stick with that. I mean, to me, the more code, the worse it is, <laughs> inherently, you know, um, unless you could really justify that code growth. And I'm not making jokes about the FreeBSD kernel. So. Um, so anybody else? Questions, comments? Cool. Thank you very much.